All right, everybody, if we can start, go ahead and get going here. Um, so I am have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Todd Score. As soon as I find my sheet of paper. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, this is actually our great session on uh, precision and population from investigators from around the state. So first I wanna remind you that there's two microphones here um, and also someone walking around with the volunteer uh, microphone as well to participate in the Q&A. So after each of our presentations, then we'll have time for question. Uh, we also have someone online that is uh, monitoring the chat questions. So if you are listening remotely, then please go ahead and feel free to put those in. All right, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd Score, who's gonna be f facilitating this session. He is a professor of medicine in the IU School of Medicine and the Zerbe, Zerb uh, Professor of Pharmacoeconomics. Uh, and one of his really many roles is to lead the NIH funded pharmacogenomics implementation grants. Um, it really seeks to identify and overcome barriers of pharmacogenetics to guide our clinical therapy. And I know in nephrology, we use this a lot. So thank you, Todd, and welcome. Thank you, Sharon. Um, uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, be introducing the speakers uh, this, to this morning's session. Uh, I think we've got a, a diverse group of speakers that are going to be really uh, fascinating, uh, I think. And um, our uh, first one is Dr. Kosoli. Uh, uh, Simon, uh, she is the uh, Distinguished Professor in the Herman B. Wells Endowed Professor at Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, and she's also the Chair of the, and the Associate Vice Provost of Health Sciences uh, down there. And I think she's going to uh, talk about, you know, one of these resources, uh, I think, I hope, um, that uh, uh, we now have as part of our institution uh, that has a lot of things like claims data and stuff where uh, you know, as we've been doing implementation research, at least we've dipped our toe a little bit into this sort of stuff uh, where you can really ask a lot of questions from these big uh, databases that uh, that uh, a lot of people have spent a lot of time putting things together. And we uh, are lucky to have a expert uh, in, in uh, using these sort of databases. And so uh, today we're gonna hear about uh, population health research using these large scale administrative uh, data, data from that. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. I'm going to talk about some of my research with large scale administrative databases. But really the, the main story that I'm going to tell is how increasingly it's become more important for us to take a community approach to understanding how to access and democratize the use of the kind of new innovative information that leads to transformative research. And so I'm going to keep talking about how important a pivotal role CTSI plays in this and bringing community together to have, have this um, type of approach that we have. So um, before I get started, um, Disclosures are, I'm an employee of Indiana University. Um, so my research is, is funded through the Indiana University by NIH. I do not have any consulting arrangements that I am part of. I'm on many government panels and institutes internally and externally. I am part of the health advisors group to the Congressional Budget Office as part of it. So in my, in my research, and my talk today, I am going to go over how important changes have happened in the way we have access to information and how, in, how we should continue to pay attention to how we democratize the way that research is conducted in order for the information that is generated to have a translational impact. So I'm going to be talking about the theme of precision and population in combining population health topic, population health research, with the importance of precision, which is understanding a wide variety of information about people, which is not easily accessible when thinking about how we have to ensure good partnerships, responsible use, and securing private information. And yet that is extremely important for us to get the kind of 
kind of answers that make impact for, for research. And so I'll talk about what has happened, a little bit of a mini tour of the way that population health research has evolved, what are future trends, and um, come back to thinking what can CTSI continue to do to make sure that we just going to talk about the role of universities and institutions as well. So I'll start with a, a personal story. My first experience with research was as an undergraduate student in upstate New York. I was transcribing paper surveys for a professor, Derek Jones, who brought these paper surveys in a suitcase from Bulgaria. Back then, we didn't have red caps, so this is the way surveys were transported. And as I was getting ready for graduate school, Professor Jones said to me, it's really important to understand the community with whom you do research. So he encouraged me to go spend a year in Eastern Europe working with the stat central statistical agencies and getting to know trade union organizations because the research was about worker ownership of companies. And so I, I, I appreciate that there's a long tradition of collaboratory community models of participatory research that ensure that that what you're working on is really is what should be worked on and 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 that it is such a, a key part of CTSI. And so um, I'm going to go through how, of course, the types of data, the complexity with which we approach things have evolved a lot over time. Just a few few examples for population health research from from uh, examples. So Victor Fuchs, Dr. Fuchs is uh, somebody who's a, been a key influence in analyzing the US healthcare system in his first health research that he conducted in the in the 1960s he used a combination of philanthropy nonprofits industry government organizations and i'll describe how that was he used data that was collected by nonprofit organizations funded by philanthropy commonwealth foundation industry partnership was that the ibm foundation provided him computing time and this was population health research. It was looking at social determinants, safe transportation in, in health. And so we have had a lot of advance in population health research and the kinds of data that are being used. Here's a, uh, a paper by two other very influential people in, in policy and, and health economics research, um, Dr. Curry and Dr. Gruber. They looked at this question of how public policy, expanding Medicaid access. This was in the, in thinking about the early 90s, late 80s, the first big expansions that happened in Medicaid access. They were using a wide variety of government collected databases. They were using them in parallel. So I'm gonna make the distinction between using data sets in parallel and do, using data sets that are linked, linked being the connection to precision. But this is what was happening in the 90s. Predominantly, insights were coming from government collected large databases that were used in parallel. And, and these uh, the, come from the collection of birth certificates, death certificates, as well as the Census Bureau surveys, the precursor to the American pop, uh, community surveys. Um, and, and this was what was happening in the, in the 90s. And so my first experience, my first opportunity to think about how a community resource might be useful in public health research was when my uh, dissertation advisor at the time, who is uh, William Evans at Notre Dame, who is the, one of the founders of the Lab for Economic Opportunity at University of Notre Dame, he um, uh, gave me this chance to be involved in a paper that was looking at the types of data being used in population health research to categorize them. And I remember feeling overwhelmed at the amount of data resources that were there. You know, and, and we did categorize them into six categories, but it felt like there was just such an enormity of information. Little did I know how more complex things would be in the next quarter century. Right? Thinking of that we will. So at the time, these are the, the databases that were available were largely as a result of public 
investments, many, many, these were the workhorses of the of population health research with taking on these surveys that were done by CDC and the Census Bureau and, and as well as efforts that had started to get administratively collected data, like birth certificates, aggregated the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, it went by a different name earlier, but they were part of getting statewide collaboratories, getting hospitals to be able to transmit all the discharge records and various ways of getting things. But there always were, even, even then, opportunities for more innovative forays, thinking about forging relationships with industry, and so those, those were existing, and, and, and we know well in the state how much of a history we have in the health information exchanges in what the Reagan Street Institute has done for so many decades of getting partnerships with healthcare organizations in order to take information that was collected primarily for healthcare delivery and patient care to be also able to be used for translating research impacts. So this was happening, and this just become even more so that the rewards to these kinds of things. So I'm gonna talk about the rise of some of these large administrative data collaborations at federal levels, at state levels, and especially those have a, have, that have continued to link and make more information available. So the story is gonna be lots of big efforts have happened that link information that allow us to know about many parts of people's lives and that type of extra information and precision is needed to be able to know really what's going on beyond the, the big, big drivers that might be just very aggregate state by state differences. You've got to get a lot more granular in knowing what people's environments are like, what their own characteristics and health information is like. But it's happened together with needing to ensure secure privacy of where, how we're using that, and that's going to be what all this infrastructure is trying to, trying to deliver. So one big chain, one big uh, innovation that's been happening, and it started in the, in the 90s with just a few universities collaborating with federal agencies, starting with the Census Bureau, was to create what were called research data centers. These were physical locations you walked into after having gone through a big background check and the research question was vetted by these agencies and then you got permission to be in it. So I um, was one of the, uh, at, I was at the University of Maryland doing my dissertation work and because it was close to the Census Bureau, I got to use one of these data centers for my dissertation research. And I've seen how since then almost every state has one and then we are soon to open the first location for, for Indiana State, thanks to investments from the from Indiana University's research office and many others. But this is going to be a, a, a way for us in the state to access information from agencies that would not give this information out unless it's under very, very secure settings because it has to protect the privacy, but, in, but understands that in order to guide public policy, we do need to have these, these answers. And so this is happening very soon. An example of the kind of very influential paper that's been written out of the center at, at the University of Michigan has been to show, and to continue the theme from that paper of the early 90s, Medicaid expansions as having saved lives, was to show that the Medicaid expansions that happened through the Affordable Care Act in 2014 also were saving lives. And this has been a really important part of supporting the Affordable Care Act through research, or, or rather analyzing it through research, is, is to show the, what, whether there are benefits and to show that there are benefits. So this has been done. I'm gonna talk now about how more recently the turning point that happened through the COVID-19 era is that it really changed how we seem to interact with industry in data. So I'll talk more about the shift from public, uh, public investments to thinking about more industry partnerships that have happened. So we all well remember how, how st struck we were about how inadequately we felt prepared for what happened. And it was a time when we realized and public health agencies were quite in the middle of understanding how 
the access we have to information happened at that time, it was accepted with quite a lag. We were used to getting two-year-old data because that's how long it took for public investments to be, to, for the Census Bureau surveys to be collected and cleaned or administered data to be gathered and disseminated. And so we, 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 we knew we didn't have the data, we needed it right away. And so there was many ways in which we all opened or, in, or, or uh, increase the speed at which we opened the Pandora's box of the data we didn't know existed that was being collected but was for the large part off the radar screen of, of, of researchers because it was not being collected for research but it is a kind of administrative data it's for program functioning of a different kind it's for delivering services that were happening and so some of the first glimpses we got about this is through cell ping data, mobility data that was being used. Public health agencies started using these data very quickly. There were industry partnerships, uh, pro bono arrangements that were made. And, and we at Indiana University signed one of these pro bono uh, agreements to be able to use this information for COVID research, to, to COVID related research. And I'll talk about some of that soon. And so that was not the only case. There was a, just a, a vast array of of, of data sources, we didn't know a lot of unstructured data, and there were consortia that sprung up that, try, that, that aimed to mediate access for researchers, try to put quickly together what was legal language and data use agreements that could protect privacy and, and ensure that, but it was done at lightning speed. There are many pros and cons to this. It's not information that was collected for population views, sampling frames and, and weights don't exist to project to population. We had to come up with innovations of methods that would allow that. There were um, no prior publications to look at. So when you went to funding agencies and tried to describe these, there wasn't much of a track record. And uh, the data use agreements had unclear lens of how long could we use this. Most of them were written with the, when the public health emergency ends, that's when the pro bono terms would be, would be ending, and that's hard for getting things into publication, knowing that. But it was available immediately and, and was a very big part of how we got to know what was happening during, these, during the immediate pandemic times. Um, at the same time, we were also seeing developments in the field of research methods that would allow drawing insights for public, public policy from observational data. And so my, my colleagues and I wrote this paper at the, about, the same, about that time that was in the annual reviews about how to use these methods for public health, public health research. These methods also evolved really fast. And so this year we published an update to this as a, as a how-to guide to implement the innovations in methods fields for these uh, practical guide. And so, now I'll, I'll talk about an example of how we take these, uh, these, these new data developments together with these study methods to, to answer questions that we're pressing. So um, I'm gonna talk about a, a paper that looked at what happened during early pandemic times in cancellations of appointments for healthcare that had been booked beforehand and to understand what the health implications of those canceled appointments are using linked data. So we are um, going to talk about these data in a, in a bit, but it's, it's an enormous amount of information that we were able to get through one of these industry collaborations that were presented through these consortia to universities to, to, to be able to access pro bono for COVID related research. And it, it, this one database I'm going to talk about contained one in every five Americans are in this database, and it's uh, uh, then linked to death records through an industry method of linking. So the question is about use of healthcare that is at the margin. And so I'm going to go back to a quote from, from Victor Fuchs. Victor Fuchs summarizing in the early two, 2000s, the state of literature was that there is a considerable amount of care that is considered flat of the curve that is maybe not changing population health. But the problem is we do not know which part of healthcare that is. 
or we try to, and maybe there are different answers, but I'm just saying that's a consensus. There isn't one that there are things to, to change. And so we wanted to see, well, what do we know on average about the care that is canceled at the margin? And so we talk about this one database from that, that enormous number of things that became available was one that is, um, had 70 million patients and very, very detailed information about scheduling times because it came from a company, Health Jump, that was collecting the data and putting it, cleaning it and putting it into apps that allowed patients to schedule. And so we had very detailed information on about when the visit was called in, whether it occurred, what it was for, what the follow-up tests were, lots of information like that. And it had been linked. So I'm now going to talk about the importance of linking. We ourselves don't do the linking. There are many honest brokers. There are um, services, Reagan Street Institute serves as a, a NOS broker for, for linking information. And so this, this was done as a link by Datavant. Datavant is a healthcare technology company that does this kind of secure linking of, of data. And then it comes to us, the researcher, in a de-identified form, but it has a lot of information that you cannot get in just one source alone. So this is a, the Datavant death index is one that is used to find out who is alive or not by combining administrative together with scraping all of the obituaries that are published in papers. So it's the kind of data we wouldn't have known existed. It's, it's that it exists because of technology, uh, always existed in obituary notices, but nobody could have scraped it all together. And so this is um, using 20% of the US population's electronic health records together with this use of information. So we knew pretty much if somebody was alive or not at, in, in real time almost. And so um, what we did is use a study method that mimics what a trial, a, a, a randomized trial would have been. So imagine that there are two patients, they look identical, they call for an appointment. They're calling in, let's say, February of 2020. One of them gets their appointment scheduled for March 20th. Another one gets their appointment scheduled for March 5th. They look identical, but one of them gets their visit canceled, the other doesn't. And so we've got a large number of people for whom this experiment was happening by nature. And so we're able to look at how because they both then subsequently lived through all of what the pandemic meant to all of us. It wasn't that one lived in a pre-pandemic period. They're, they're experiencing the next two, three, four years of their lives as identical, except one sort of as a randomized trial, we removed a healthcare visit from them that had been scheduled. So maybe the follow-up tests and scans and things they would have received don't get. And so we look at them later on and they follow, we follow them through in the death records to see do they look. And the end, end result after a lot of data work and, and methods is that with a statistically detectable difference in mortality rates and comes to the, the message being something like one, one additional death for every 333 cancellations that happened. So this is just an example of what getting Getting all this data together can give as an answer to a question that otherwise wouldn't be possible without an answer. Well, now talk about another example that uses Indiana data because we do have, we have amazing resources that we can do, get more insights with, with more, more investments. And this is going to be of Indiana's in, in the INPC, Indiana Network for Patient Care, which is mediated access through the Reagan Street Institute together with CTSI investments in feasibility studies. And this is about COVID vaccines. So we're gonna talk about how, even though we knew trial evidence at the time, we didn't know from a real world study yet how effective vaccines were. And to be able to know that we would have to have a randomized control trial in real world data and public policy gave us one because of the age rollout of the vaccine it meant that almost identical children who were one day born apart had the vaccine six months difference because if their birth date wasn't on a certain day they had to wait six months 
And so we got a natural experiment and ability to study this, but the ability to carry through with the study was only going to be possible if we could get access to information that had all that, all that detail, the exact birth date, as well as we also wanted to say it's not just that we want to look at what the real world estimate is, that the, whether, it's, whether it's what the clinical trial found, we want to study something that the clinical trial wasn't able to study. The clinical trial wasn't able to study the social impact, the spillover, the community effect of vaccination. How important is you, you being vaccinated for the health of the people nearby? What, what did you, you being vaccinated do to the reduced risk of adverse health events for people near you? And so we can do that from real world data because we can look at those who are nearby. But again, for this, we needed to know what school district you're in, what class you're in, what household you're in. And but we did not, we did not need to have that individual information. We just needed to have a way that some honest broker would link the data and make it available to us in de-identified form. You just have a, some, some indicator for, oh, you're part of the same household or not. We don't need to know which household. And so we were able to get this in, um, in, in uh, the data that I'm going to describe and have uh, four different research designs. So again, we're using these difference in difference methods to mimic what a trial, what a randomized control trial would look like with population health data and to look at, to go beyond clinical trial evidence to look at the spillover impacts for populations. So this is the linking of the data sources, the linking of the Indiana patient network as well as the vaccine registries with the Reagan Streif Institute linked and so was available to us this way. And we then went through the same lots of data work and, and methods later, we were able to find that um, we were able to look at all these outcomes at vaccination as an outcome. We were able to look at COVID incidents from the testing registry and hospitalizations and adverse outcomes as well. And so what, what we found was that the real world evidence shows that the clinical trials were pretty well. The real world numbers matched pretty well the, the trial data. So that was an important finding because you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't expect always that that's the case. And we also found important spillover impacts, but that the context mattered, that somehow the, the, the school setting was not a, what the, the general um, amount of contact people have with school peers was not enough to extend the, the spillover in that way, but we found that the household was. So there was spillover protection from vaccines within households, but not in, in school context. And that was the, the takeaway from that. And so there is an enormous amount of information. And um, when we're talking about data these days. We cannot not mention the role of AI. I'm not going to say much about AI here, except to say that it does affect the way that data use agreements are being written by the, the originators of, of data. And it does change the kinds of platforms and tools that they are comfortable with researchers using. And so we've got to keep keeping that in mind. When we're thinking about what insights we're going to draw and what lessons. And so just as the that, that picture was just an AI generated picture of complex data. This is a real world picture of complex data. This is my walking around at a recent conference and looking at all the booths of what is being offered for researchers. So there's a lot of this new wish because it's been around, but it's just accelerating um, so much potential for the kind of questions we can ask in understanding biologic clock data combined with survey information and, and neighborhood information linking. So there's a lot of linking for precision and um, but lots of challenges about this. And this is where the community aspect comes in. So one is that it is extremely resource intensive. It is intensive in terms of what might be licensing fees, what might be agreements for use of computational platforms, the credits that are used for spinning the servers. And it's also expect for the kind of training that has to be done. When I think about how much training and, and uh, vetting somebody has to go through to be 
allowed to be a researcher within one of these federal statistical data centers, for example, it's not for the faint of heart. You have to really take a lot of, a lot of time to, to be doing that. And that is what's needed to protect the integrity of this information. And so I was gonna say that there is a lot that is required of federal government investments, state government investments, universities and initiatives to make this happen. So it does feel like there is, is, is a lot of information and, and, and care has to be taken to, to how we improve. There's also, we gotta keep attention on what we don't have much, much, much um, data on and how important that is. So at the same time that in 2020, we were paying so much attention to COVID related news and numbers, and there was the continued and accelerating epidemic of the opioid crisis. And so we were not paying that much attention because we didn't have that much data on where it shifted. We still don't have very good sources of information on illicit markets of fentanyl. And this just goes to show, you know, we look for and, and will be, and, and I'm subject to this, I look for what I can do with what information is available. We gotta keep knowing that, that where the problems are, are necessarily not, not necessarily where the data are. And so this is part of it. We also don't get to observe necessarily what we want. When we get to see information from electronic health records or claims data, what we see are people who are connected to care. If we care about people who are not connected to care, we just gotta keep, in a, we, we, we don't know. And so there are opportunities, wearables sometimes offer these, but there's you know, a lot of, lot of um, um, so just to quickly now mention examples of things that CTSI is part of increasing access to, this is mediating access to an NIH collected source of information that tries to get links of people's information, even if they are not connected to care, but by en enrolling and encouraging and participation in this study, the, the All of Us program aims for a million participants. They're pretty close, at close to half, uh, half a million. And this is information that has the potential again for transformative research and um, CTSI has received, has received uh, one of the NIH grants that makes it a site for the increased access and dissemination. And so please look for, there are, I've put up links here, but there are many ways to get connected. And I'm gonna showcase an example of published research by one of the, the researchers at the School of Medicine at Indiana University and colleagues, uh, Dr. Jing Su and his team have published this this paper recently on risk factors for liver cancer using the all of us data mediated through the CTSI. So we there, there you'll see the news release when a CTSI received this and how to get connected. You click on that connection, takes you to a red cap that is going to get your, your information and somebody will contact you. There's also by taking together these supplements, I'm gonna mention now university supplements and what it is that the that Indiana University has done in investments in this area to try and promote for everybody, for the whole state, uh, more, more access. So there's a training program that's been created where you can asynchronously learn about and how to get connected to this. So that is, the, these are the modules you'll go through so you can uh, assign them to students in classes. What we hope for is that therefore, as, as students getting, in, getting familiar with these sorts of tools that the workforce we have in the state then is familiar with how information can be used in transformation. So role of universities and in and, and this. So Indiana University has recently and for a while been investing in, but this is the launch of it, uh, a resource that we call the, the Research Data Commons. And think of it as simply a front door to what already exists. So many places have so many services, but it is hard to know and have a front door feel to it because the role of data in, 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 in society is just rapid, so, so fastly evolving. And so this is an initiative funded by the Vice President for Research along with technology, libraries, and other, other partners. And the way this website is set, and you can go to it, it's at researchdata.iu.edu, and it's now live. And you can click on, if you want to interface by thinking about how you're conducting your own experiments and generating data from it that you would like to share, or you are creating a data security plan for your 
NIH grants, this is all these services that can be. We follow the framework of the National Institutes for Standards and Technology that has, uh, has, has, has sort of advised that all organizations, universities take this kind of approach and you can get all of these uh, as sources. So any kind of question you have about research data, that's there. There's a catalog of these services that, that universities provide. And then there are these featured data programs. So taking what we already have as licenses to many or IU or IU institutes created data, INPC data being featured here, as well as many other institutes and, and centers have amazing resources trying to think about how to increase the demo democratization of knowledge and therefore participation. And again, coming back to this being a central mission of CTSI. And so I'd love to get comments at any point about what more can be done and uh, really appreciate this opportunity to get to talk. If, I think we have time for a, a few questions. We're, we have a long lunch break uh, scheduled, so if we go a little bit uh, into that, I think we're, uh, I think we're okay. So uh, open for questions and maybe I'll start with, uh, with one, um, you know, with, with the access to all the data with uh, investigators can now uh, get access to a lot of uh, this type of data. We have to sometimes balance the uh, availability to, for instance, me as an investigator who's not really trained in some of these sort of things with giving me access so I don't have to go through eight layers of, uh, you know, administrative stuff to get to it, but yet not allowing me too much where I can misinterpret it. Um, you know, I think as the uh, opioid or the, uh, the COVID epidemic showed us, you know, people overnight uh, became epidemiologists, everybody from our grandparents to our kids to our politicians, right? So you see a bunch of data and all of a sudden there's lots of things, but we need to balance that somehow. How do you see that balance playing out? Yeah, absolutely. So we need to have that knowledge be transferred and for people to all feel like they are part of part of knowing how to how to understand messages because it also happens at the same time as a, as as you know concerns about mistrust in science but the role of expert intermediaries is very important and so thinking about biostats departments and places that have uh, institutes that have their data services teams it's really really key to think of how we work in partnership because it is we need to be able to work together so it feels like it's part of a team and yet letting each person's expertise be used in that way. Sure. Great, because I just want to reemphasize to everyone that this not only is that like where to go get the data, but it walks you through which of those 9,000 forms you have to fill out. Um, and so there's actually a step-by-step -step process in there. So it, rather than guessing and finding out that you did things the wrong way or that you didn't do them at all and you should have, um, Coastly and has just done a great job leading this collaborative effort. Um, there are people from other universities outside of IU. Can you comment on the ability of people not at IU to access this? Please? Yes, absolutely. So this is this is really important because if we had our ideal world, we would make everything open. But we know that agreements, legal agreements, are signed organization by organization. And so that is a limitation of the real world we have to live with. However, it does not limit the science. It does not limit the collaboration because we are the the again thinking about the roles even if there is just one person whose specialties or, or a set of people who are actually touching the data and that's where the legal agreements come in the legal agreements do not constrain the science and the tr knowledge transfer so it could be that in fact this has happened we have often heard at indiana university about a resource that purdue university first got to know and it's that sharing of information that says, oh, we should also go and try and write our own agreement. And so that we have multiple access, but we could have always collaborated to do the research with Purdue as being the place that had the access. So I think this is a way to think about it. It's a community resource, even though we're living in the constraints of all the legal protections that have to be there for this. Go ahead. Always great to hear a talk from you, uh, Kosali. Is this on? Yep. Yep. 
so one question about the democrat democratization of data you talked about. You know, this is something that you and I are very passionate about. We also know it's really complicated. So part of it is, of course, educating people in what is the data source, what does it cover, how do you use it, what are the fields. But then there's the issue of what's the quality of the data? You know, what are the intricacies that you only know when you've really dug into? Can you talk a little bit on how you see kind of addressing all those things in a manner that advances the university and CTSI? Yes, thank you. And it's such a pleasure, Titus, to get to work with you on all uh, of these things with CTSI in the biomedical informatics core. We spend a lot of time talking about these topics. It's that every, every source of information is, has got its characteristics that you have to think about for whether it's fit for purpose. For the kind of questions you're asking, there are going to be a sets of, sets of things you need to know. Well, I need to understand that if, if I'm going to report uh, some, some information about um, deaths that happened in these circumstances, that sometimes the source, of, the cause of death is maybe not recorded as, as you would like, or the tests weren't done. And so how do you convey, how do you understand? So one is that it takes a village, it takes a, a, a user group, a, a, a set of people who are using a certain resource to create infrastructure, to create guides, to create GitHubs from whatever you've published that say, here's what we have discovered. And so it's like the process of any other discovery it builds on it, it, itself. And you say, I, I know these things, now I'm gonna contribute by showing uh, validation tools. I'm gonna do some sensitivity checks. I'm gonna show the extent of missingness on this. And then you think, how do I still in, instill some knowledge knowing that it is in the context of these imperfections? Okay, uh, thank you. And I think we will move on. Uh, that's, that's thank excellent. you very much. Either way, you can up or down. It's probably easier to see down there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Simon. That was awesome. 